Hi, everyone. We'll give it just a moment. Let some people join. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. I'm Allison Jordan. I'm the Executive Director of the California Sustainable Wine Growing Alliance. And on behalf of my team and all of our partner organizations from California, New York, Oregon, and Washington, I'd like to welcome you to the second U.S. Sustainable Wine Growing Summit, and especially to today's tasting and webinar. Next slide. These organizations have been working together over the past few years to establish a common definition and principles for sustainable wine growing and winemaking, to conduct trade and consumer research, and to promote the US wine industry's commitment to sustainability. We hosted the inaugural summit in Sonoma in 2019, back before COVID days, and even the second virtual summit has been a great way for our, organiz our organizations to come together. We thought a virtual tasting would be a fun and experiential way to kick things off during this virtual year, the everything virtual year, and to share with all of you not only what we're doing, but even more importantly, what U.S. wine grape growers and vintners are doing on the ground, day in and day out, to be responsible environmental and community stewards. So thank you all so much for joining us. Next slide. We wouldn't be able to do this summit without our incredible sponsors who stepped up in support of the summit. In particular today, I wanna to thank the tasting sponsors who include the wineries that generously provided the wine that some of you are enjoying today. Ampelow Cellars, Fidel Cellars, Chateau St. Michel, Hartford Family Winery, Stoller Family Estate, and Wente Vineyards. You'll be hearing from four of the vintners from these wineries today and two others in the coming days. Many thanks too to the awesome team at Master the World who were responsible for getting the wine kits to you all. And finally, thanks to our other tasting sponsor, AA Vineyards. So today we have a fantastic panel and a lot of ground to cover. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Evan very shortly, but I do just wanna touch on a couple housekeeping notes. First, um, we are recording this and it will be made available, shared with participants in an email with a link following the summit. We also have allocated time for questions and answers following the panelists opening remarks. So please do know any questions you have throughout the session and please use that Q&A section or, or button on the screen. We'll get to many of your questions as we can today, um, but we'll also plan to respond to any remaining questions after the event. And finally, the chat section is also a great informal way for you to communicate with other attendees, but make sure you note if you want to send it to all panelists and attendees um, because it does default to panelists only. And I think many of you are familiar with this, but we will be sharing two videos. If for some reason the audio isn't working or it's a little bit delayed, please feel free to follow the link that we'll add in the chat box to watch the video directly from your own browser that will take care of that issue. And with no further ado, I'd now like to introduce our esteemed moderator, Evan Goldstein, Master Sommelier, co-founder of Master the World and Chief Education Officer for Full Circle Wine Solutions. He's one of our country's most prolific food and wine writers and educators, and we're so lucky to have him leading us through the tasting today. Thanks, Evan. Over to you. Great, Allison. Thank you so much for uh, having me with you. And it's really a treat to be with everybody here today. I want to say what a treat and thrill it is to be doing this, um, something that's so important to everybody. Before we actually get started, I'm going to make some just opening comments, if you will, and sort of set the table uh, for everybody. But for those of you who do have wine, and I understand it's not everybody out there, if you haven't done so already, um, I would encourage you highly <laughs> to crack open the, uh, the screw caps and pour the wines into the glasses. They will benefit tremendously from air. Um, it's kind of like if you were squished up in a little 187 milliliter bottle, it would take you away a little bit of time to kind of uh, get your, your bearings together. So if you do so, please do that. Hopefully and ideally for those of you who have um, the, the wines out there, you also have six glasses. I would open and pre-pour all the wines and not do it on a case-by-case -case basis again to just give them the benefit of uh, doing 
the aeration thing as we actually get there. As far as the wines go, and as Allison mentioned, we're going to have a, a window to taste each and every wine uh, in four of the six cases. Um, I will be um, joined by our esteemed panelists and winemakers are there in a couple of cases. We have videos um, that, that will join us instead. And then lastly, before the tasting, just two other points. Number one, as you've probably noticed, for those of you, again, who have uh, wines, they are all labeled very conveniently with the Master of the World uh, sleeve, which is hiding the identity of that. For those of you who opened up your kits even a day or so ago and logged on and did the whole MTW thing with the uh, algorithm and grading for the blind tasting, that's what that's there for. If it's too early on a Monday morning and, hey, Evan, I don't want to play, I don't want to blind taste, I just want to be able to do that, you can um, peel off and the sleeve on the backside and reveal the wine. So all of the wines look like this as you see them, but they all have a sleeve there. If you pull up that little white sticker um, and unsleeve it, you will see the identity to all the wines there. So for those of you who are just not game on this, uh, this Monday morning, I totally understand that. And I would totally appreciate you want, doing what you want to do. The only other thing I would say about tasting is, um, although we're going to be talking about specific intervals and winemakers will come on and off at appropriate times, you should feel free, free to delve in and enjoy the wines as you like. Uh, nothing drives anybody crazier than being at a wine tasting and, you know, 45 minutes into a 90 minute tasting, they get to the first wine and people are just absolutely perturbed. So feel free to enjoy the wines, maybe guess a little bit if you're doing it blind. Uh, thank you um, earlier, Allison, for mentioning the wineries, but not the wine. So even there's that little facet of things there and um, we'll rock and roll. So let me just sort of kick off by uh, sharing a couple of thoughts with you before we, we jump in. So worldwide, sustainability is more and more culturally embedded. Cultivating countries may set and have different priorities, but what they all agree upon is that leaving the land in better shape for the next generation is their number one concern. Globally, as the human population increases, changes in land use are destroying a lot of the world's natural habitats. And with mounting evidence that unchecked agriculture is contributing to unprecedented biodiversity loss, models of environmental stewardship and regenerative agriculture are gaining ground. Research indicates to us that beneficial insects and the birds and the bats that feed on said insects are more numerous and diverse on untreated land than on land that's been sprayed with chemicals. Moreover, soils managed sustainably contain far more organic matter rich in microbiology. Sustainable viticulture is to a large extent about the harmony of, with nature. And when prompted, if you ask people about this, most everyone's got these knee-jerk associations of vibrant flowering vineyards, cover crops, composting, and again, those happy spiders and bees. But as we all know, sustainability is much more than those associations. Today, sustainability is not so much the exception, but rather it is increasingly becoming the new normal. In addition to the environmental aspect, it includes social and economic considerations and their implementation. Fair working conditions, water management, green building, green electricity, and carbon put footprint reduction should all complement me measures such as vineyard greening and avoiding herbicides, and do so, I would add, on equal footing. Of course, to su defining sustainability is really complicated because of the unique environmental stresses of different wine regions, which we will hear about today. The biocontrols that attract beneficial insects in one place may attract pests, may attract pests in another. Vineyards in humid regions depend far more on fungicides than in dry regions. Consequently, one will find numerous sustainability certification programs. And today, that is why, as we explore different American wine regions and learn from our distinguished Vintner panel, we will be hyper-focused on place or rather location-based sustainability. As you will hear during this webinar and moreover in the sessions that follow during the multi-course, multi-day symposium, there is also a venting, if you will, of the concepts of what defines sustainable, organic, and biodynamic, some of which is self-evident and some of it less so. In the end, I always say, and as we're going to learn, sustainability is akin to producing a really well-made rosé. It's not white, it's not red, it's not necessarily organic or biodynamic, but critically occupying a space or glass somewhere in between. So on that note, we're going to kick off, and I'm going to introduce my first speaker. Again, we're very blessed to have four speakers uh, with us today who are going to walk us through what they're doing 
uh, the vintner and myself will taste the wines together and we'll move through this incredible uh, narrative. And for those of you who are tasting, textured narrative of what's going on. So I'd like to have uh, Rich Olson Harvish, who's the winemaker for Bedell uh, Cellars in New York, join us next. And he's gonna talk to us a little bit about his thoughts. And um, then we're gonna taste his wine. Rich. Thank you so much, Evan. Can you hear me? Very well. Okay. Very well, thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Evan, for that wonderful introduction to sustainability and to the summit. And I wanted to say thank you as well to Lisa and Allison and Thane and the CSWA and the rest of the folks that helped put this together because there's been so much wonderful, uh, and I know a lot of hard work to make this happen. We were supposed to be in New York last year. We were supposed to, we held out hope we would be in New York this year. So I'm happy we can still be together in this way at least. And, and I'm thrilled to be able to represent the East Coast on the issues surrounding sustainability. So the North Fork of Long Island and the East End of Long Island has been around for um, quite a little while and the, the modern grape and wine industry only started around 1973. Uh, however, historically, the region has been growing grapes and involved in agriculture in the U.S. since the early 1600s. We go back to about 1639, 1640. So there's been a lot of activity here. One of the first... Um, industries on the East End was bootleg alcohol uh, back in the late 1600s. So uh, the history is there. However, we didn't really realize that we could grow uh, European varieties until about uh, 40, 40, 50 years ago. So we're still a relatively new region. Fidel is a, um, one of the founding members of the region and we were started in 1980 and we have a 40 year track record of sustainable techniques actually with the original owners even before the phrase became part of our lexicon. Uh, we have 80 acres of vines and we're a true holistic estate doing everything from growing, to fermentation, to bottling, to storage and delivery. It's all uh, under our control, which we're really proud of. The North Fork is a cool climate maritime region that owes its existence to the proximity of the surrounding waters of the Atlantic Ocean. And this was a little map I wanted to include. It's really the, the North Fork we're talking about. That one finger that, that uh, it's like a fishtail. The top of the fishtail is, is angled at about 45 degrees into the Atlantic Ocean. And what makes it really special is that we're getting uh, west to east weather patterns over the water first before hitting our land, which is, if you think about it on the East Coast, not very common. So we're in this real Cinderella, um, not Cinderella, Goldilocks, excuse me, got my fairy tales mixed up. It's a Goldilocks region uh, because it's, it's this confluence of events. Uh, the surrounding water, the soils are all glacially laid down. They're very, very well drained. Uh, we have beautiful loamy top soil that's overlaying sand and then ultimately gravel. So it's just a beautiful filtration system and water doesn't really get anywhere near the roots of the vines, even though we're not that high in elevation, which as you can see, this elevation map, we tend to be you know, around 50 feet, um, anywhere from 50 to, uh, to 100 feet in elevation and sometimes less. So uh, relatively, uh, not a lot of topography. However, the terroir that we see comes from the subsoil uh, and that can be quite evident from vineyard to vineyard. We have one of the longest growing seasons and one of the most mildest winter temperatures on the East Coast. We have a 220 day plus growing season and it's getting longer by the, by the year. This is one of our vineyards you can see right on the water of Peconic Bay. And this allows us to grow these varieties, these European varieties that um, before the mid seventies, no one really thought was possible on the East Coast. So this region again has these, this confluence uh, allowing us to do this. Um, we're gonna have a, uh, we are tasting, I'm not gonna, supposed to say what the wine is, right, Evan? 
you can if you, if for people that are doing it, we'll we'll hit that slide in a moment, and we can talk okay. about it as we start tasting. Everybody who does have that wine, go out and taste it if you haven't been doing so already. But Rich, maybe you could talk a little bit. I know when we were um, had our, our pre call, we were talking a little bit about some of the local groundwater things that you have to deal with. It maybe again as we look at this sort of concept of site specific or location based sustainability that some of the other people um, who are going to be talking later don't necessarily have. Can you address that a bit? Yeah, absolutely. Water is so important to what we're doing. And it not only allows us to be where we are and grow what we can grow, but it's also what we are drinking. We are right on top of a sole source aquifer for the region for the entire east end of Long Island. So Long Island in general is on an aquifer. Uh, however, closer to New York City, that has now been replaced by public water. However, on the east end, it has not. And so this is the sole source of drinking water for literally over a million people. Uh, and so what we do in the vineyard is very important and has been one of the driving forces behind our program on the East Coast called Long Island Sustainable Wine Growing. Everything that we're doing above the ground is going to wind up showing itself under the ground and into the water. So that has driven our program. It has driven the decisions that we've made regarding what we uh, allow our members to do, can use. Uh, we particularly have uh, very high, large concerns about nitrogen. Nitrogen runoff is a huge issue for the East End, again, because nitrogen is so leachable and moves so freely in the soil. We have to be very careful. And it's one of the, uh, I think, one of the parts of the program that I'm most proud of is the limitation of nitrogen that growers are allowed to use. Um, that's good. No, that's itself great. produces. Yeah. No, I was going to say that, that that's great. I think it's really important um, as we move from Vintner to Vintner that we're going to focus on kind of something unique about what, what, what makes your area there. Once again, this is not a one size fits all Buster Posey t-shirt that you get at a, a Giants game. Um, sustainability <laughs> and, and how we're applying it um, is going to be different from place to place. So I know I interrupted you a little bit, but maybe we can both pick up our glasses and start uh, talking about the wine um, as well and, uh, and and tasting it. I think one of the great opportunities we have today is bringing this to life through the glass. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Bedell is a, a company, we produce about 12,000 cases annually. All, the, all 80 acres are certified sustainable th through our program. And all the wines that I'm producing here are, are, are through uh, the use of native yeast. So I'm not inoculating, it's all spontaneous fermentation. Um, I've become extremely confident in our terroir and its inherent ability to produce really balanced and refreshing wines. So uh, what we have in a glass today is a single vineyard wine from Alberino. And this is a, a variety that's relatively new to the East End, about 10 years old. Um, and we uh, first learned about this through our research vineyard in Riverhead through Cornell University, which is our land grant uh, university with the agricultural school. We have, uh, there are a number of uh, test vineyards throughout New York. And our program here is particularly geared to our climate. Alberino showed itself to be something that was really, um, had, had a real affinity for our region. It was uh, a grape that would get completely ripe every year, would not be, it, the birds were not interested in it. And it would never really succumb to any bunch rots, even in rainy vintages. So just a real winner of a variety. This particular one is a 2019 um, fermented with natural yeast. It's all stainless steel um, and single vineyard. I really haven't done much else to this wine except minimal intervention. Put it in the bottle. Absolutely. No, and I, and I think this is great for those of you out there who are familiar with uh, Albarino or Alvarino, depending on what mm -hmm. Siberian reference point that you have. Um, this is very, uh, first of all, Rich, um, congratulations. I mean, it's so true to the type. I mean, it's got the wonderful confluence of, of that brightness and that lift of uh, acidity and aromatics, um, not masked, as you said, by any by any oak or any other uh, things going on there. But it does pick up on both sort of that tropicality uh, nature that, that you get, the stone uh, fruit characters, again, ideally more underripe than ripe albarino. For those of you who don't know out there, thought of uh, was thought of at one point as being a relative of Riesling, because alba means land and rino meant rind. But in fact, they're, they're two completely different um, varieties 
varieties. But what's really striking to me about this wine is that uh, one, it's very true to its its variety in the sense it's got classic typicity of that. But two, and and um, it, I don't see this necessarily on as all the domestic albariños that I've had here. It really stresses a, a minerality and and almost a. Uh, um, that that sense of place that you get if I was in like Condado de Tea in in uh, in the Rias Baixas. I mean, where the wines do literally pick up something from the uh, adjoining sea nearby that you can physically taste in the wines. And this wine does have a very distinctive minerality to it. Um, and before I let you go, any thoughts on that? Is that something that you see and find typically, uh, Rich? Or is that unique to this year, or has that been something that you've been enhancing over time? No, it's, it's nice that you picked it up because it is a common thread that we see not only in Albarino, but also in the other whites and even the reds. We term it a, a saline minerality uh, because we are getting some of that uh, from these wines. And I don't believe it's something that's picked up through the root system. I do believe it's, it's more of an atmospheric, uh, uh, you know, just phenomenon that's occurring. Um, because quite often when I'm traveling away and I come back to the North Fork, you can smell it in the air immediately upon arrival. And so it's, it's there and it's in all of our wines. And this crispness that we have is all natural. We don't have to add acidity. We're, we're ripening very cool. So what I'm trying to do here is just kind of preserve what's given to me every single vintage, capture it in the bottle and, you know, really let the terroir speak for itself. Well, you've done a terrific job, Rich. I mean, what a what a wonderful Thank way you. to kick off today and uh, kick off the tasting and kick off um, our, our things. So uh, on that note, we're going to switch. We're going to move and we're going to move from uh, live and in living color to our first video and leave New York and come back to the confines of California and specifically into the Central Coast, specifically into Monterey County and Arroyo Seco, where we're going to um, taste for those of you who have it. Um, spoiler alert, the uh, Riva Ranch Chardonnay from Wente Vineyards. Um, for those of you who don't, we're going to learn a little bit about it. Um, and while you're going to have this short video uh, with my friend Ali Wente in a minute, for those of you who are attending the other sessions, um, there's going to be a whole uh, vineyard sustainability tour, if you will, with Nikki Wente tomorrow. And I would encourage you to not only join that virtually, but um, if you can, I know it takes a little bit of willpower. Don't finish all of the wine in the bottle today. If you have wine, maybe get a can of private preserve and get give it a quick uh, hit of um, nitrogen on it, put it in your refrigerator and bring it out so you can actually try the wine when, uh, when Nikki's talking about it tomorrow. So with hope that technology goes well, the video begins. Hi, I'm Ali Wente, a fifth generation wine grower. We're standing here in the Livermore Valley at our beautiful Wente Vineyards Tasting Lounge. You can see people standing behind me enjoying their wine. I'm here drinking our beautiful Riva Ranch Vineyard Chardonnay. It comes 100% from our estate grown vineyards in Arroyo Seco, Monterey. All of our vineyards are sustainably farmed. It's something that we care greatly about. Our winery is also certified sustainable. We care a lot about the soil, keeping carbon where it is. We run a no-till system. Um, we also use some really great uh, ways to manage our water outputs. We recycle all of our water. Um, and we have really fun pest management systems. One of my favorite is our falconer who's up from dawn until dusk during harvest with her beautiful birds helping us save all of our wonderful grapes. So if you want to learn more about our sustainable practices, you can join in the virtual video summit on sustainability on Wednesday, April 21st. But back to our wine. It's a beautiful, rich, full-bodied Chardonnay that um, has a lot of tropical fruit flavors that comes from the long growing season in Arroyo Seco. We harvest this around November. That's pretty late for Chardonnay and that's because the climate is so cool. So instead you get this beautiful intensity from the fruit because of the extended time that they're hanging on the vine. Um, and then we barrel ferment this wine. So you get a nice creaminess, richness on the palate and it keeps you coming back for more. I hope you enjoy. Cheers. Thank you so much for that, um, Ali. That was really appreciated. She did half my work for you, but I'll, let's go ahead and taste the wine together uh, for those of you who do have it. And I think she's um, she's spot on when she she brings out the hallmark uh, tropicality. Uh, pineapple, of course, is probably one of the most signature 
flavors of uh, the Central Coast and of the Monterey County area. You find a little bit in the San Lucia Highlands too, but certainly in Arroyo Seco. Um, but what's nice about it is even understanding that you are who you are, she's managed to, um, to uh, show restraint or I should say Wenti has managed to show restraint in there. So while you get that strong um, flavor of, of, of pineapple and, and, and melons and things that are tropical there, it's not the full on you know, fruit cocktail, Hawaiian punch thing that can get away from you in this part of the world. And part of that is obviously um, good viticulture, good uh, and good winemaking. But part of it is the use of the barrel fermentation here, which is, you know, my fear with that is that you always have to have the right kind of fruit to manage that over because if not, you know, you've got fruit in a two by four and nobody wants to be drinking two by fours or chewing on two by fours when you should be enjoying a delightful Chardonnay. So here in this case, I think it's well melded, it's well blended. You obviously get the sweet baking spices and all of the uh, bells and whistles that good oak brings. But again, it doesn't mask that wonderful for, um, flavor of vibrant, uh, tropical fruit. The wine's got delicious texture. Uh, delicious. It has great texture. It's quite delicious. Very long, very expansive finish and a nice Chardonnay example um, to uh, to kick us off. When, once again, if you do have some of this wine, please save a little bit at least uh, to join um, Nikki tomorrow when you're going on the vineyard tour because it'll bring the tour to life a little bit for you. So with that said, we're going to switch gears completely, and now we're going to go up to Oregon, and we're going to get to hang a little bit with the absolutely fabulous Melissa Burr. Melissa's uh, Vice President of Winemaking for Stoller uh, Family, uh, does a terrific job up in that part of the world. I was first introduced to them on a couple of programs earlier this year, they just kept popping up. Um, and as I tasted the wines more and more, I understood why. Um, the wines I think you'll find are delicious. This would be wine number three. Not gonna tell you what variety it is yet, um, but nevertheless, it gives me great pleasure to have Melissa uh, join us and talk to us a little bit about what she's doing and what's going on up in uh, the beautiful Willamette. Melissa. Thank you, Evan. I appreciate it. And I'm honored to be a part of this conference and represent Oregon and also specifically Stoller Family Estates. Uh, I've, I'm an Oregonian, grew up here. I've been the winemaker at Stoller Family Estate for going on 18 years. So I've had a really wonderful opportunity to grow alongside with one company, but also to be in Oregon and be part of the growth of Oregon. And I really like to point out when I talk about wines and I talk about Stoller, I like, love to talk about Oregon and our, our region in general. And one thing I find so compelling, there's many things about Oregon, but we are very small. Oregon only makes, produces, and grows about 1% on average of all the wine in the United States. So that's really just a, you know, a drop in the bucket where small volume uh, producing, but we've, I, I feel that Oregon's really been a part of the world stage now uh, in terms of wine quality. It's full of passionate wine growers and winemakers, and it's a unique place to make and grow wines. We're, we have a cool climate. It's, it's also considered under the cool climate on the heat units, similar to other climates that produce um, Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir is the number one planted and grown variety in Oregon. Might be a little hint to what may be in your third wine, the wine from Stoller. I don't know. I mean, just taking a guess here, but Pinot Noir is what we're known for because of the percentage of all of the varieties we have. We've got over 70 other varieties that we grow here, but we're known for Pinot. Um, again, cool climate for most of our state. The majority of the wine grapes are grown in the Willamette Valley which is a 200 mile long valley that starts just north of Portland and runs down south to Eugene. And for those of you who have no idea where that is on the map, if you saw, which I should have included a map of Oregon next time, if you saw the state, our region is, is west of the Cascades. And this valley is again, a cooler climate. And we have these hillsides that provide us a great medium for growing wine grapes. What we're looking at right now is Stoller Family Estate, which is located again in the Willamette Valley, but we're in the AVA called the Dundee Hills. And the Dundee Hills is really the motherland of the industry starting um, a little over 52 years ago. This is where some of the very first Pinot Noir was planted. So we're located in this valley and the Dundee Hills is basically an island of hills. If you were flying over in a helicopter, it looked like this oasis of hills. And most of the hillside in the Dundee Hills is volcanic soil. 
Uh, it's this red clay loam soil. One of the names is called Jory. That's our state soil for Oregon as well. A fantastic medium for growing grapes. Also in our valley, Willamette Valley, there is this exposed marine sedimentary soil, which really defines our, our area. The Stoller here, this is a, two, a 240 acre vineyard that's located on a 400 acre piece of property. And the start of all of this comes from the proprietor, Bill Stoller. He's a third generation Oregonian. He grew up farming this piece of property in the Dundee Hills for many years with his family. His aunt and uncle owned it. And he developed a, his own career and fell in love with wine along the way and started to recognize the potential for his uncle's property, which could be a vineyard. So Bill Stoller purchased this 400 acres in the Dundee Hills in 1995, and he planted 20 acres here on the estate, 10 of Pinot and 10 of Chardonnay. And today it's grown to 240 acres of wine grapes. So uh, his vision has always started with a really a tremendous pride of Oregon and ownership in this property and his family legacy. And that's really where I think for Stoller family estate, the essence of the sustainability started is with Bill. Uh, in a bigger context, Oregon in general has a culture of sustainability. There's a tremendous amount of focus on environmental impacts across so many industries, but specifically with our grape growing and winemaking community, Oregon's vineyards, which are just over 8,100 acres in total of vineyards across our state, almost half of those vineyards are certified sustainable with some different measure, whether it's Oregon Health, um, USDA certified organic, Demeter biodynamic, um, or live certified. So live is a big part of our community in Oregon for grapes and winemaking. And it's a low input viticulture immunology. I know a couple of my cohorts are on this call today at, and they can speak volumes about live, but really important for sustainability in farming in Oregon. And uh, Stoller Family Estate is 100% live certified in our vineyards and also in our winery. So live is a research base, um, accountability program. We have a really fantastic committee of, of folks across the industry. We look at the health of vineyards, the ecosystems of vineyards, the watershed and the safety of workers in general. So it's a third party certified program. So people who commit to live commit to all of these things, improving their farming every year and their practices, but also the third party certification. So this is a really pretty shot of one of our vineyard rows and speaking to what we're doing in the vineyard with live and with sustainability as we like to rotate different cover crops. Yes, wild wildflowers for ground cover. Yes, so beautiful. My favorite, my screensaver is from last April around, the, well actually this is probably May, but these poppies and they're always in bloom on my uh, Zoom seminars because I think they're so pretty. But more importantly, uh, they provide uh, they provide a place for insects and they provide nutrition for the soil. So our team is always rotating through cover crops and, and so on. And I could speak volumes. I don't want to go on and on. So Evan, you keep me, you keep me focused. Oh, I, I see you nodding your head. <laughs> I was, I was, no, I was happy to do it. You know, you, you, uh, I was thinking about when I needed to get that sustained, but you brought it up organically. No, actually pun intended. Yeah, um, so, yeah. so that uh, we were there. I mean, it sounds very much to me, Melissa, like you guys take an extraordinary holistic approach towards everything and, and really 360, if you will, your entire process there. Is there something that, that, that you see? And again, you know, you've traveled a lot and you spend a lot of time, not only in the Willamette Valley, but obviously uh, around Oregon. Is there anything that you've known Noted, um, or Im implemented specific to the Willamette Valley vis-a-vis -vis sustainability practices that you think, um, you know, is again sort of a local based or locally uh, thought of sustainability practice that you might have that is different or applied differently than somewhere else? I would go, I would refer to live, this certification program. Mm -hmm. It's not only Oregon, it's also Idaho, and I think we're going to Washington, but it's it is, um, it is a really big part of what we're doing. And there's a lot of forward thought and meetings and, and planning to not just stay put with sustainability, but always improve. Mm -hmm. We have a really collaborative industry in Oregon. I get the comments all the time when I travel, how collaborative our winemakers and vineyard managers and such are. And we're always looking to new things, whether it's an electric tractor demo and trying to move in that direction or you know, different, different kinds of things with cover crops and such. So that's what I would say. We're very collaborative yeah. and we're going forward. 
I was going to say, and you know, that collaborative approach, I was on a, a seminar with, uh, with Bree Stock, Bree, hello, I know you're out there somewhere, uh, earlier this year, and one of the things that came across to me in listening to not only Bree, but also several of your colleagues, of really the collaborative approach of, of sharing of information, sharing of practices and things like that, that is, um, it's not quote unquote unique to you, but you do it better than most people do and more heartfelt than a lot of people do, which is great. And uh, obviously sustainability is at the core. So let's go ahead and try this wine. We can now tell people, because we've given them enough time to try it blind, if they haven't peeled off their sleeve or whatever. Can you tell us a little bit about what we're tasting and a little bit about the wine itself? And I'll jump in with some thoughts also. Absolutely. So this, surprise, surprise, is Pinot Noir. This is our 2017 Reserve Pinot. Oh, that's my mom. This is so wonderful. Go Sorry. mom. I haven't seen this photo. <laughs> and my son when he was very little. But anyways, this is our, our Pinot Noir from the Stoller Estate. Again, we have 240 acres. We've got many sections of Pinot with all these different characters to them. We spend a lot of time blending the reserve Pinot to reflect what we think is a the best expression of the vintage. A lot of this is our older vines coming from the property. Elevation anywhere from 200 to 650 feet. So we're really trying to weave this expression of a picture of a wine we tend to age this in bottle for at least a year and a half to two years before we release. We make three different levels of wine, if you will, a, a, a mosaic, Dundee Hills, all the blocks and sections, a reserve really woven from some older vines. And we do make a third tier that focuses on single parcels or blocks because they are very expressive. So all native fermentation, a similar story that we heard earlier um, that I, I really appreciate what native yeast can do and I trust the estate to provide a healthy culture that will do a successful fermentation so I'm really fortunate to be able to do that with this reserve pinot. Absolutely. Can you tell us a little bit, you know, one of the things I always notice in, um, uh, I'm going to steal a, a, a great line from a friend of mine, uh, Patrick Comiskey, who I'm sure you know well over at Wine and Spirits, but he always speaks to the, for lack of better words, Oregonness of Pinot in the state of Oregon, which he, you know, he describes as, as being perhaps a little bit more savory, less fruit driven than we are here in, you know, in Northern California. And, you know, with a wonderful stress on structure um, of, of place of provenance, but also, you know, um, just a, a savoriness or an herbalness and all those other things. What in, the, what in your mind's eye is sort of like classic Willamette Valley and even frankly, classic Dundee Hills, Oregonness about your Pinot Noir? That's a great question. Well, when I think about Oregon, I, I agree. I feel I, I sense Oregon is has a bit less opulent, expressive upfront fruit than our mm -hmm. beautiful, sunny neighbor in Cal neighbors to California to the south. Uh, we also tend to have a lot of acidity in our Pinot Noirs. This is all reflection of the cool climate. When it comes to one Oregon style, those are two things I find true um, given any of the AVAs. But when it comes to what I feel makes Dundee Hills Pinot Noir, our specific AVA, um, so unique and here at Stoller is 100% Dundee Hills. Because a lot of times this volcanic soil I see gives us a cola and a spicy note in the Pinot Noirs consistently, whether it's a warm or cool vintage that I think is unique to the Dundee Hills and also a, a minerality, like an iron quality. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it could be even like, like an umami kind of character that it comes out from, from the, the wines and then typically a finer green tannin. So kind of the silky tannins from the Dundee Hills is what I would say would characterize uh, wines from the area. No, I, I, I would say, it's, obviously, you know better than I do, but, but my observations would be spot on as well, too. There is almost sort of like a, the polish, that finest part of the sandpaper that you use. You know, you can get different grades of it, and it is a very, very light thing. There's, there's almost, if you will, sort of like a creaminess and a voluptuousness to the texture of the wine, yet it has that lovely acidity, which I think is hallmark of, of your part of the world. Obviously, your latitude's different than ours down here in California, permit some of that uh, growing season hang time and all that stuff. Um, and for those of you who are not super familiar with uh, Dundee Hills and Oregon uh, Pinot Noir. This is a great way to uh, do that. For those of you who are testing out there, put a picture, mental picture of this wine in your head. If you ever get a glass of wine on like this, this is a really uh, solid archetypal example, I think, of its place and all that too. Melissa, thank you so much for, uh, for joining and for sharing uh, with us. And obviously, Melissa will be back in Q&A with everybody else. Um, I'd like to shift gears now and go back down 
um, to California and back down um, to the southern part of the state. And I'm going to ask uh, Peter Work to join us from Ampala Cellars. He's not only the winemaker, but the proprietor of her. And he's going to speak to us a little bit about what he's doing, uh, both individually, but he's been a huge driver of the sustainability movement um, in California in general. I'm sure we'll talk a little bit to that as well, too. Peter. Great. Thank you so much, Evan. Thank you for having me on the show here. And you know, thank you, Alison, and Lisa, everybody at CSWA. It's great that you are putting this on so we can still celebrate sustainability. So I'm Peter Work uh, from Ampelos Cellars, and I kind of wear two hats in regards to this. I'm a farmer, I'm a winemaker, a storyteller. But the other thing is that I'm involved in the CSWA organization. I've actually got the big honor of being the chairman of it uh, for the next couple of years. So I do whatever I can to always try to promote the sustainability. Let's talk a little bit about where we are, get, get the next picture here. So just to get everybody dialed in, we are in California. Uh, we are in Santa Barbara County. I'm sure many of you guys have been there. And in Santa Barbara County, you've got Santa Ines Valley. And it's very interesting with the geography we have down here. When you look at the Western United States, you have the coastline that's kind of north south. That means the mountains here, Nevada is north south, Maya Kemas between Napa Sonoma, north south. But down in Santa Barbara, we have this break where we have a southern facing coastline. And that also means that the mountains we have here are east west mountains that gives us these valleys that goes out from the cold Pacific Ocean and into where we are located in Santa Rita Hills. So we only locate about 10, 15 miles from the ocean, whether we go west or whether we go south. And that gives us this great influence from the cold ocean, where we get typically in the summertime, we get the marine layer that will come rolling in late afternoon, early evening. It will be sitting there for the night and in the morning, it's cloudy. And then we see a little blue spot and eight, nine, 10 o'clock, we got sunny weather for the rest of the year, the rest of the summer. And the other thing is that we got uh, six dry months. So in the summer months, we don't see a drop of rain from now on until September. It's dry where we are, but we get the rain in the winter months. In 1999, Rebecca and I, my wife and I were looking around for a piece of property. We were out of corporate America. We had no idea about growing grapes. We couldn't even keep our house plants alive as we joke about, but what we had this crazy dream of finding a piece of land to uh, plants and grapes. We found in, in 99, 82 acres of raw lands that we then decided to skip our career and move up and start becoming farmers. So that is what happened from 2002. We've been focusing on really doing the best we can with farming. Today on our property, we have a total of 25 acres planted with uh, different grapes. Of course, in Santa Rita Hills, we got uh, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay Pinot Noir is what most of Santa Rita Hills is about. But as we will try in this wine, we are also pushing some of the other varietals that we can grow in our area. Let's go to the next slide, please. So speaking about sustainability, uh, in 2003, we got into the sustainability uh, great growing guide that was made by Wine Institute and Cork. Great, great guide but we are looking for a certification program because everybody was saying sustainability left and right. And that came out with a SIP certification, sustainability in practice in 2008. We jumped onto that. We have then since converted to the CSWA, which as far as I understand is now the largest sustainability certification program in the world. What I wanted to share with you guys out there is just a couple of practices. And we've heard about those already from some of the previous speakers, but uh, cover cropping, very important. We steal from Mother Nature every year when we take clusters away. We got to give something back. One of the ways we do it is by seeds with these wonderful legumes, fava beans, sweet peas, veg, oats, rye, that will uptake the nitrogen with 80% of the air and bind the nitrogen. And we will then at the right point in time, mow it and disc it into the soil. Thereby we get nutrients we basically create ammonia then becomes nitrates, which is a macronutrient that goes in the soil. Secondly, talking about insects below that, it is very important to learn to work together with mother nature when you do conscious green farming and follow sustainability practices. So what we see is a lot of beneficiary insects. I took this picture a couple of years ago of just this colony of 
ladybugs that was right there in my canopy. And we love the ladybugs. They go after the bad insects, the leaf hoppers, the aphids, et cetera. Just a wonderful way of keeping those around so we can work with mother nature to avoid spraying insecticides. Part of sustainability is also thinking about energy. So in 2008, we installed two solar panels. We are 100% self-sufficient when it comes to electricity. And my last little picture in the corner is my, my chicken. Love the chicken. We, got, uh, we got, had 50 chicken over the winter, but we have hatched 70 more. We expect to get up to about 200 chicken. What do they do besides laying eggs? They are great because they actually get out in the vineyard. They go after the ants. And after we started having chicken or in our vineyard about 10 years ago, we indirectly eliminated the mealy box. So we don't have to spray against mealy box because the ants that are hurting the mealy box are taken care of by the chicken. So these are just great sustainable principles. Let's grab the last slide. Following you know, the, the, if you're, as you're addressing this last slide and, and before you jump into your winemaker and we you taste your wine, can you talk a little bit? I mean, obviously you're, 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 you're well qualified to, to, talk, to speak about it, but one of the things, <coughs> excuse me, that some of my friends have talked about is that, you know, the difference between sustainability and then certification, like organic certification, biodynamic certification. Can you talk a little bit about where sustainability and sustainable practices fit within the context of being certified and going through the processes of same? Absolutely. I'd be glad to do that. So let me first do a little definition thing. So we are certified organic, we're certified biodynamic, certified sustainable, first vineyard in the US to, to have all three certifications. The, where the organic is focused on materials mostly. So for instance, you don't spray artificial fertilizers. You don't spray bad synthetic um, uh, fungicides. Uh, you don't spray herbicides. You don't do a bunch of things which is great farming principles. Then the biodynamic goes beyond that and talks about what are things that you should apply out there, like building up healthy compost with the biodynamic preparations, using quartz crystals, cow manure, et cetera, as a part of the farming principles. Also talks about timing aspects where the moon is in regards to the constellation, et cetera. But the organic and biodynamic principles are really only focused on soil, plants, and the cosmos around us. That is where sustainability mm -hmm. even is much broader because like some of the examples I talked about energy use, right? So we wanna be conscious about renew using renewable energy sources. Sustainability also thinks about the people, the employees taking good care of the employees, talks about social responsibility, how mm -hmm. to become a good neighbor, financial responsibility. It doesn't help us that we are great farmers if we are going bankrupt next year. So that is where, for me, sustainability is broader, more holistic, organic, biodynamic gets deeper into things, literally like the soil, if that Wonderful. makes sense. What, what, a, what a great uh, summary of, of all of them. So um, let's, let's talk a little bit. Yeah, one of the best ones I've heard. I agree with you on that one, Patrick. Let's talk a little bit about this wine. Um, we're going to now release the identity of the wine. Thank you all for playing around, for those of you who are blind tasting, and for those of you who have it. What, what do we have here in the glass? And... Um, which we'd be looking for within it. I'll throw up some thoughts as well. But you know what? It was hard for me to dump that uh, great Oregon uh, Pinot that stole out. That was just a delicious <laughs> wine, but I finally, I, had to do it. I finally had to do it and pour my own wine. So, you know, I, I want to say cheers to everybody out there. I can't believe it. We got hundreds of people on this. I saw there are people from Singapore, from Spain, from Portugal. It is amazing. Cheers to everybody out there. Thank you so much for being part of this sustainability celebration here. And cheers. Mm. All right, so we are in Pinot Noir country where we are, but because we have this amazing climatic situation that I mentioned before, we can grow a lot of different things in the Rita Hills. And this wine is an expression of that. It is a Rhone wine, obviously. It is a uh, upside down Chateauneuf du Pape wine, as I like to call it, where Chateauneuf is, you know, Grenache driven with some Syrah and other things. This is Syrah driven with some Grenache in it. So it's about two thirds Syrah, it's one third Grenache. It's all estate, so it's all from our vineyards. And we have this long growing season. So typically we pick our Pinot Noir in September. There it is, right there. Thank there you. you go. 
We take our we take the, the Pinot in September, we get into October, typically the first couple of weeks in October, it's time to pick Syrah. And end of October, sometimes even into November before we get the Grenache in there. So that's how we made this wine here. It's a 2016. It is made, like you see on the picture, it's all native yeast fermentation like the other uh, presenters talked about. It's just mother nature. If you do good farming, you bring the grapes in, they got the yeast that you need. You don't need to put man-made yeast in it. We never had a stock fermentation. We've done na um, natural winemaking for like 13 years now. So no nutrients have been added to this wine, no tannins, no nothing. It is just grapes that come in. We de-stem them, get in little fermenters, get two punch downs a day, get into barrels. This one has been in oak barrels for about two and a half years with about 25% uh, new oak, mostly French oak. I use a tiny bit of American oak whenever I feel that it fits into the wine. That's uh, it's, pretty much it. It's a, it's a delightful wine. I have to say that when I was doing the pre-tasting for this wine um, and had some of my neighbors over just because, you know, they always see open bottles and they, they run over to, into the backyard when we're, we're doing stuff like that. I think I, I, I'm looking forward to my commission because I think I single-handedly sold a couple of cases of this wine for you. They were all saying how wonderful, you, again, it's, I love your analogy of it being an inverted uh, Chateau Neuf du Pop. And for those people who've spent time with Chateau Neuf, uh, do pop growers, particularly those of them who have Pinot Noir envy, and a lot of them really want to make great Pinot Noir. They call Grenache the Pinot Noir of the Rhone Valley. And a mm -hmm. lot of them, you know, if you can find places where Pinot does well, and Grenache can also uh, have the joy of, of ripening and being able to do so, you can actually apply um, interesting techniques here. And this one is called Sirach, which speaks obviously to the Syrah and the Grenache together and has a wonderful combination of obviously the, the marking flavors of the spiciness of, of the Syrah, the structure and the architecture of that. But, you know, that sort of upfront, um, you know, again, it, it's almost like a savory opulence, obviously due to natural winemaking and such there, that's just delightful um, and, uh, and really a, a joy to have um, an eye-opening wine, I think for a lot of people, um, not running the same classic, again, your inverted um, metaphor is a great one and, and just a joy. And thank you for sharing it with us as well too. I hope everyone who has the opportunity to have this wine in their glass um, does what I did when I tried this wine, live it, let it actually get more air. This is a wine that the more air you get into it, you leave it your is. glass out and come back to it in about two or three hours, it's gonna be even better than it is right now. And it's already awfully good. So Peter, thank you so much for, uh, for sharing that with us and sharing your wine. Absolutely, thanks Peace to you. And uh, we're going we're gonna to make our final physical stop with a winemaker and jump all the way back up to Washington. So we're going to wave it, uh, Melissa, on the way over and go up further north into uh, the Columbia area, Columbia Valley area. And we are joined next um, by Holly. And Holly is going to uh, uh, join us um, from Chateau St. Michel and take us a little bit of uh, what's going on there and specifically um, what they're capable of doing. It's a, it's a, what's interesting here is here's an operation of scale um, compared to some of the others and how they're applying sustainable practices there I think is really eye-opening um, to be commended. And we're delighted to have Holly Wells with us uh, who's the enologist up there. Holly, join, please. Hi, Evan, thank you so much. And thank you, um, Allison and Lisa, everyone for putting this together. Um, I, it is an honor to be here and to represent Chateau St. Michel in our Sustainability Summit. Um, so here we go. Here's the vineyard. Uh, Chateau St. Michel is Washington's oldest winery. We actually just celebrated 50 years of winemaking in um, 2017, which is the vintage that we will be tasting today. And here at Canoe Ridge Estate, we make all of the red wine um, for Chateau St. Michel. The vineyard was planted in 1999, and the winery was up and running in 1993. Two certifications um, that we have both in the vineyard and the winery are live and salmon safe. Under these certifications, we commit to managing sustainably our soils, the vines, the pests, our water use in the vineyard, and then coming into the winery, we are able to manage our recycling and energy conservation programs, all while protecting the wildlife. And there's the beautiful vineyard there. Um, and across the way is Oregon. So you can see across the Columbia River, how close we are. <laughs> Next slide. So here is a view down um, our vineyard here. Our property is just shy of 1,900 acres with over 900 designated two native habitat. 
Our soils are well-drained and sandy. We're located in a warm site, although we do experience some cold uh, winters, but the um, vineyard is moderated by um, the Great Columbia River. And today we're actually gonna be tasting our Cabernet Sauvignon, which is our second most planted varietal amongst the varietals on our property. Next slide. So something that we want to talk about um, with live is when we have a wine that uh, we want to put the live, that we have the live logo on, we have to be able to trace it back from the bottle all the way to the vineyard. So how we do that is when the fruit comes in from the vineyard, we designate a code to it and Canoe Ridge Estate is um, the number 12. So here we can follow all of our Canoe Ridge Estate fruit from the vineyard into the winery, through the fermentation process, um, into the barrel during our blending process, and then right into your very own Canoe Ridge Estate bottle. And under the live certification, we are not allowed to use any um, GMO yeast, which is also something that we cannot use in the United States in general. And our wines have to be under a total of 150 parts per million of SO2, which most of our wines when we go to bottle are between 60 and 80 parts per million total. Something that I'm really excited about here at Canoe Ridge Estate is we recently received our organic certification. So this last harvest, we um, sourced from a grower in the Walluk Slope and we made our first organic Cabernet Sauvignon, which is actually bottling this month. So quick turnaround. Um, as for organic wines, you cannot add any SO2. And we made sure to um, follow all the organic protocols um, and of course document. And this certification must be renewed every year. And last but not least, uh, we are excited to announce that Washington is um, actually developing our own certification program. So we are actively working on this program with the Washington Wine Growers and Washington Wine Commission to create a framework for our grape growers throughout the state to achieve a sustainable certification as early as next year. More to come on this and um, hopefully we'll be talking about this sustainable program at next year's summit. Excellent, Holly, that's terrific. I have a question for you that I bet now as, we, as we're tasting the wines, again, spoiler alert, but you've had it, but we're, we know it's Cabernet and right by the nose, we know it's Cabernet as well too. Question for you, given given <laughs> the uh, the size of the production that you guys have, obviously you're the, the, the big kahunas up there in Washington. How do you do it? Do you do a delineate? How do you separate your fruit out? Because clearly not everything that you're going to be working with is going to fit all these parameters. Is there blockchain on the blockchain that allows you to control purchased fruit, which maybe you don't have as much control over versus your own fruit? How does that work for everyone to know? Yeah, so um, every fruit, every lot that comes into the winery uh, before we even uh, crush the fruit, we make sure that it has a lot code. Um, as soon as we have the lot code, we designate a tank um, for that fruit to go into. And during the crush process, we make sure that that fruit gets into that tank. Um, and then throughout the fermentation process, we see that every time we visit that tank, we know where it came from. So like Canoe Ridge Estate has the number 12 to it. So every time we see a 12, so say um, CAS for cab, 12, the vintage, um, and then what block it came from and when, uh, when it came in during that time. So some of our other uh, vineyards are designated to block um, code 10. We also have um, our Cold Creek Vineyard, which is code eight. Mm -hmm. So we, we can keep the fruit separate by um, designating them their separate numbers and their separate codes. Got it. So there's truly separate, sep no pun intended, separation of church and state between all of your lots from all of your sources so that you're able to manage and ensure um, the complete authenticity of uh, sustainable organics, biodynamics, all those things that you're playing with. That's great. Why don't you talk to us a little bit about this wine and then I'll jump in with my two cents afterwards, but it's just a delightful glass and very, um, again, classic of, of Cabernet from this part of the world. Yeah, no, thank you. I uh, this wine is actually really special. This is the first year um, that I had joined Chateau St. Michel as enologist, and it was a cooler vintage. So uh, our season started out a little bit cooler and then it warmed up. So we were able to catch up in the vineyard. Um, and then as 
harvest approached, it got cooler again. So we had we saw some longer um, hang time in the vineyard with the fruit without sugars um, getting too high. And we, ha we also saw some retained acidity in the wine. So I think that this wine is um, beautiful. It's elegant. Out here at Canoe Ridge, we see some nice gusty winds that lend some elegant tannins. And just from that year being a little bit cooler, we have some brighter fruit, some pure fruit characteristics. This wine aged in 70% new oak um, for 18 months. Oh, no, I, I think it's lovely. I mean, first of all, I would have, um, I'm glad that you validated because I was thinking to myself that that, that it, it seemed to be a cooler year based on my own tastes and experiences. The acidity in it is is just lovely, but it seems to, and it's riding. And again, that's probably that extra hang time that you were speaking of having the sort of opulence of fruit that, that we all know you're capable of doing up there, but because it's cooler, it actually accentuates some of the the other um, non fruit So, you know, there's there's almost like a slight kind of like a tobacco leaf or a graphite -y thing going on there that might be more Bordelais in nature, but often, as we know, we find those characters um, in your part of the world. And a nice polish. Um, the, the oak, I think, uh, not, as I said earlier, when we were talking about the, the Wente uh, Chardonnay, not all wines can handle that much new oak and not taste like completely new oak. But I think this wine here, particularly as it opens up in the glass, is showing this wonderful integration of having um, everything that we like new oak for without overwhelming the fruit. So it shows a tremendous balance, great structure, nice length. Um, I'm going to find a bottle or two and stick it away for a few years and forget about it because uh, I'd like to see where it goes. So thank you so much, uh, Holly. I'm sure a lot of people are going to have questions for you too when we come back, but we're going to zip back Absolutely. down from Washington. My pleasure. And uh, finish up back in California, appropriate being where I am today. Uh, and we're going to not be necessarily down in the central part of the state where we were with the Chardonnay and with Peter's wine, but we're going to be up in the Russian River Valley up in Sonoma County. Uh, we're going to be joined by our friends at Hartford Family Winery, and most specifically by my dear friend, Jeff Stewart, who's going to walk us through on the video. He's going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the wine and about what they're doing. But uh, please know again that if you can gas and save a little bit of this wine, uh, we're going to be jo joined with them on Wednesday for another uh, panel session on what Jackson Family is doing in their whole um, holistic approach towards um, sustainability and, and uh, practice they're putting in place. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff Stewart. Hi, I'm Jeff Stewart, winemaker at Hartford Family Winery, here to talk to you about the Hartford 2018 Russian River Valley Zinfandel. This is a wine we make from several sustainably and organically farmed vineyards in the Russian River Valley, a very cool growing region in Sonoma County. Uh, we ferment these different vineyards in small tanks, then age the wine in French oak for barrels for about 10 months. Uh, we bottle the wine unfiltered, unfined, and you end up with something like this in my glass that's just bursting with big exuberant blackberry uh, jammy flavors a little bit of spice and just really speaks to the place and kind of the classic Zinfandel flavor profiles that we see. Uh, very rich wine, but very food friendly and something that uh, we, we've been making here at Hartford since 1994. And uh, amazing heritage, 100 year old vines that go into this wine. So truly a piece of California Russian River Valley grape growing history right here in the glass. So. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. For those of you who know Jeff Stewart, that's the least amount of time he has ever spoken when asked a question about there too. He has so much to say and I hope he joins uh, on Wednesday as well when we talk about it. But this is, uh, I, I believe, um, a wonderful uh, opportunity to try Russian River Zinfandel, which unfortunately, I, am, I don't want to say it's going the same way of the polar bear that Sauvignon Blanc is in that part of the world, but nevertheless, the land is so valuable um, and so many people want Chardonnay and, and Pinot Noir that we lose track of that. But fortunately, there's enough um, great Russian River Zinfandel still in the ground, much of it, some of the oldest plantings of Zin in the area. And what I love about this wine is despite or I should say in spite of the, of the fact that, yes, I agree with Jeff, it's got lots of black fruit and dark fruit characters as well. Um, there is nice ripe red fruit undercurrent there and a really um, uh, crunchy acidity level. Um, for those people that make Zinfandel or appreciate Zinfandel, we know that having acidity is hypercritical to it. If not, it can get kind of syrupy and ponderous and heavy. Um, there's a vibrancy about this wine, um, which is, I think, true of what the grape's all about. You get the depth and the profoundness of being from older vines, uh, which is something that you would not necessarily see 
um, from Younger Vines. It has just a, a richness and an overall layered uh, character there. And again, I think one of the elements that's um, true of this wine, but I think across the board from all six of the wines, is that there is this freshness and this vibrancy um, to it. And when you have uh, healthy soils, um, I think you have more vibrant flavors. I'm sure we'll get into a little bit more about this here. And it's certainly true. When I was chatting with some friends of mine who make uh, biodynamic wines last week, they were saying that one of the things that really healthy living soils enables people to do is really be able to not only achieve phenolic ripeness at lower alcohol levels, but when you do decide to go a little bit higher, as you probably do in a Zinfandel, it enhances it even more. So it's really a, a great way to finish up. Um, a lovely wine, again, if you're going to be with... Um, the Jackson family people a little bit later in this week, save a bit of the uh, bottle there. So on this note, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask uh, Allison and team to um, unlock this stuff, allow people to, to jump in and ask questions. I know they've probably been collecting a few questions that they wanna share uh, with me to share with you. And if not, I've got a few pre-prepared questions too, but um, you've heard from all of us. We've got about 20 minutes put aside for everybody here. So if I could ask the winemakers to come back on, turn your cameras, um, on, turn your microphones on, and then if people have questions out there, um, we're going to hear about them. So, Allison, is there anything you want to um, spoon feed us first? Sure. There were a couple of questions that came in that I thought were really good. Um, one second, and I'll just pull this up. So, one was um, someone was interested in hearing what proportion of land our panelists keep or plant in native vegetation to benefit birds, bees, and bats, something you had mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. So what we do here is that we have the cover crop in between the vine. So that in itself covers quite a bit of area. And then we have some um, riparian areas, some habitat areas around us. So you know, out of our 82 acres, we have 25 acres planted for domestic use, probably three or four acres. And the rest of it is just a native vegetation that we just let grow what's always been there. Mm -hmm. As far as what we're doing on, uh, on the North Fork with uh, the LASW is we are requiring people to put aside 5% or we, what we're calling an eco-compensation zone. Uh, and as well as Peter mentioned, the, we also require uh, cover crop, permanent cover between the rows as well. So. We do have that worked into a program and we ask our members to to draw up what that where that's going to be what it's going to look like what kind of plants are going to be in there so we are trying to encourage biodiversity in the vineyard other thoughts from our other vintners yep and uh here at chateau saint michelle um almost half of our uh, estate is designated to um native habitat so we've actually planted some trees out here. We have some poplars, some willows. Um, we also have, we've put up some kestrel boxes, some owl boxes. Uh, we only get about six to eight inches of rain per year. So it's hard to grow um, cover crop in between our rows, but we do have a winter wheat that we lay down and that's what we're doing. Yeah, I'd say in general, it's something that's really common in all of our sustainability initiatives is ecosystem management, wildlife habitat protection. And there are so many private landowners that don't plant every acre they have to vines that also make sure that it's there for the wildlife around them as well. Um, another question came in from Anthony Gizmondi, our friend in Canada. Hi, Anthony. Tony. <laughs> um, and he wanted to know about the link between sustainability and wine quality, whether it's the flavor or the aromas or the taste and what is the end game for consumers? That's that. That's a great question, Alison. It'd be great to get everybody's hit on it because one of the questions that I get asked most often is, Evan, how do you taste sustainability in a glass? Um, <laughs> so that would be a great hit for everyone to jump on with. I can start with that. And I've thought about this because I, I knew this question would come up and it does come up a lot just in conversations with friends and consumers and things. And I like to think about it as uh, you think about an egg, like if you have, an egg and like a commercial egg you buy from the store, crack it open, it's kind of a yellow, like very colorless yolk. But then you get a farm raised organic chicken egg and you've got that color, but a lot more flavor. And I don't know if you could go deep in tasting notes at all the different flavors you get with these farm raised eggs, but my sense is that it's similar with wine, like all these 
holistic, sustainable practices that we do are all very positive and they compound on the health of the soil and the vine. And in essence, you're gonna get more of an expressive um, dynamic wine. And you also hopefully have happier people and happier animals and all this stuff. I don't know anybody that's done an experiment where they have the same vineyard, half of it, they spray it, you know, nuke it with all these pre-emergence and do this. And the other half is organic biodynamic. So it's really hard to compare, but I absolutely support the fact that healthier vines and soil systems are gonna make more complex dynamic wines, like an egg. Mm -hmm. Great analogy. Uh, other thoughts? From yeah, I think panel? that they, I think it's a great way to describe it there with the eggs. You know, I love to see the eggs that our chicken produce here. Um, when, when we start out, we start taking a lot of pictures and I have pictures of soil that is almost 20 years old. And I take the same pictures of the same row in the vineyard and the soil. And you can just see the differences in the soil, how the soil has been going from being like lifeless, being over farm, whatever, sand, da, da, and now suddenly it's dark. There are worms in it. There's all this um, um, microbial activity, all this stuff going on in it. And you ask yourself, which of the soil is going to produce a better bottle of wine? And it's pretty obvious, right? So it's not just about chemistry, but it's also about flavors that comes out of it. We do as winemakers, we measure things that comes from Mother Nature. Of course, sugar, pH, acidity, but we also measure the nutrients. We call it yeast, a simple word, nitrogen. Yeah, and we measure those to see what nutrients do we have in the grapes. And we can see that that has reached a great balance level. But then of course the flavors, and as I taste wines from some of our previous vintages and I taste what we are producing today, it's not like bigger, bolder wines. They are more elegant, there's more finesse, more balance in those wines. And I contribute that totally to the green farming principle, the good sustainable and organic biodynamic farming principles. And then as those grapes arrive in the winery, we all talked about native yeast fermentation. You just let the grapes become wine and that's it. And it'll be awesome. Rich, something you want to share? Anything? Well, I, I agree with, with what I'm hearing. And I, I, I've always felt that the wines that we've been making here since we've been in the program have gotten better. Now it's really hard to, it's hard to actually research this as was mentioned, uh, but there has been some initial uh, data and some tasting research that has taken place that has shown that people have preferred wines that have been grown sustainably over ones that have not. Uh, so that's starting. And I think we'll see more of that uh, coming out in the future. Um, but to me, it's even, I mean, it's more important. Sustainability as a, as a, as a process, as a pathway is, is more important even than, than mm -hmm. flavor. It's about what we're doing and, and being transparent and showing consumers and giving them a choice uh, about where they want to spend their money. Do they want to spend money with companies that are trying to do the right thing? Uh, and we're seeing this now in other types of business uh, that especially in the last few weeks uh, where corporations are coming out for various issues, social justice, uh, social justice issues, I should say. And um, they're uh, aligning themselves with various um, 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 uh, social justice reforms. And I think some of that is in play with us. And I think that is the, the most important part of sustainability. I think sometimes it's, it's difficult to quantify. So being a, a system and a philosophy that relies a lot on science to give us some of the best answers and some best practices, we do have to tread carefully. Um, but I do think that at the end of the day, we are trying to do the right thing. And for us, especially on the North Fork of Long Island, what we're doing affects the water table um, completely. And that to me is one of the biggest social justice issues there are, having equal access to healthy, to clean water for everybody. And so that's, that's kind of how I look at it in a broad sense, that it kind of transcends flavor, it transcends terroir even, because terroir can change so differently underneath an umbrella of sustainability. Stated, well stated. Allison, we have some other good questions? Yeah, one that I know is top of mind and it's actually gonna be a topic for our, one of our panels later this week. Um, it's all around climate change and what impacts are you seeing 
And what are you doing to be more resilient in the face of climate change impacts? Yeah, I don't mind jumping into that one. Uh, when I look back at wines that we made from 2008, 9, and 10, and I look at the numbers there, and I look at what days we picked at, and I look at what we are picking at now, there is a change going on. We are picking earlier than we used to. And can we continue to do that? Uh, maybe, but maybe not. Uh, I think that we have to be very conscious. And I think we as winemakers and communicators <laughs> and you, Evan, we got to go out there and let everybody know that there is a change going on here, no matter which politicians are saying what. The climate is changing and it is us who's causing that. And it is one of our jobs to let people know that they can make a change together with your, the, long, uh, the young Swedish girl and whoever is brave enough to stand up. That is one of the things we've got to do. We cannot continue to pick our grapes earlier and earlier and change the environment we live in. Agreed. For anyone else who wants to jump in, um, there was a follow-up question that was about what farmers can do to fix carbon or to store carbon, sequester carbon in the soil. Any specific practices that you're using or aware of? Well, if I can jump in, I mean, uh, just to reiterate what where Peter was going, I mean, wineries in general have been the canary in the coal mine for climate change. We, we, we've, we've seen it, we can track it. Being in New York, we get visited by winemakers from Europe every single year, all throughout the year. Every single one of them mentions that they're doing things earlier, that they have weather changes that they haven't seen before. We have roughly four to 500 growing degree days more than we did 25 years ago. For us in the cold maritime climate that we're in, it can sometimes look like a net benefit, but we have to, again, be careful because ultimately it won't be. Uh, so we've been seeing our season get a little bit longer. Our, our yields, because of the mild winters, sometimes getting a little bit larger. And um, the flavors getting riper at the same period of time than when they were, say, 30, 35 years ago. Um, so we, I've definitely seen the difference. I've made wine here almost for 40 years and uh, definitely getting much more flavor, getting much more aromatics more powerful wines. Um, so we're in a little bit different situation. In terms of regenerative agriculture, I mean, we've been doing it. We do it as, we, as we're farming, cover cropping, composting. Um, we're, 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 you know, just doing what we're doing, I think, um, allows that to happen. And we're, we're going to try to continue. I think the success of sustainability is going to depend on whether in 50 or 100 years from now, these vineyards are still going to be here. These 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 wines are still going to be made here. And I think that way that then it will be a total success. I think that's the end game: longevity, keeping this industry, keeping this farmland in this very sensitive area, eighty miles from Midtown Manhattan, uh, preserved and in farming for for future generations to take care of and make beautiful wines. Interesting. Um, Melissa, Holly, thoughts in the, the Northwest? You guys are, are you're close. You're not that close per se, but it's a whole different climate situation up there. How is how is this climate change um, affecting you? What you've seen over your you know careers of making wine? Are you seeing patterns? Are you addressing things any differently than you did before? I'd love to hear from both of you. Yeah, absolutely. I can speak to that being the same place for quite a long time. Certainly over the last 18 years that the trends of harvest dates are inching up earlier and earlier in the Willamette Valley. I mean, that said, we still have some dichotomous years. There's not a straight line to what's happening with climate change in terms of harvest dates, all the time being earlier. But the point is, on average, we're harvesting earlier. And I really like the essence of what Rich just said, that all of the things that we're all talking about today and doing in terms of sustainability and cover crops and carbon sinks and keeping keeping diversity for other species, not just a monoculture of vineyards is so important to, um, to help foster health for these vineyards so they can stick around for a long time. If anything, the sustainability is more important every single day than it was the day before. And just to kind of follow up on a question about 
at Solar, uh, we have a 400 acre property and it's about 40% of the property is non vineyard. So we've got these beautiful oak savannas, one large one in the middle of our vineyard and one um, to the west as well on the property where there's all sorts of other plants and things like that. But I mean, to follow up, yes, I think climate change is affecting the Willamette Valley and we are farming differently every year. I feel like we can carry more crop, more yield on a lot of the vintages. And then even things like less leaf pull on certain years and really looking at the, the, you know, the, the heat and the climate and all that kind of stuff and adapting our farming methodology and looking at higher elevation vineyards as well than we might have a decade ago. Like considering a thousand feet may be very viable for growing beautiful wine grapes where, you know, when it first started 15 years ago, it's just, you laugh at it, so. Yeah, certainly it's affecting us, all of us. Power, powerful observations. Holly, anything you'd like to add to the colloquy here? Yeah, I, you know, my husband and I, we moved to Washington about five years ago. Um, and so this has been a new area for us to explore. Um, but what I really love about our area is the amount of agriculture that we see here. Not only, you know, can we grow grapes, but we can grow um, apples and cherries and onions and potatoes and cabbage and, um, you know, with, with, uh, with climate change, I've been able to taste wines from, um, from 2000 all the way up to um, our most recent bottlings. And yeah, the wines do change throughout the years. And uh, we had our record breaking year in 2016 for the most uh, degree growing days. We saw the most heat units in 2016. Um, but even more so what I've noticed living up here and how it affects agriculture so much is when we have our surrounding fires um, uh, from the south of us to the north of us and how impactful that is on our area because we're sort of in this bowl on the eastern side of the Cascades. And once, you know, the smoke comes rolling in, it, it really impacts our, our crops. And so that's even been more significant um, to me to really pay attention to that sort of thing. And, you know, before, uh, before I lived in agriculture, I didn't pay so much attention to those um, impacts until recently, but I, I feel like even that's been more impactful on us. Right. Allison, other questions? Yeah, so I'm gonna ask a sort of a two-part question because I think they're interrelated. One is you're all doing all of this great work so how do we communicate it to consumers? And I think part of that, not all of it, but part of it can be certification. And so what are some of the challenges of getting certified or maintaining certification? Great question. I'll jump in on that one. A um, real good friend of mine in uh, back in my home country, Denmark, uh, he runs the largest uh, CSA program in the world where people get a box of vegetables once a week for like 50 or 60,000 people. Now, when I talked to him about, you know, what is our role in this? He was one that brought up, this is not just about being good farmers. This is not just about, in our case, being good winemakers. We got to get into educating everybody throughout the value chain. So we got to get, you know, Evan and you guys that are out there that are buying the wines, that are communicating about the wines, the wine directors of the restaurants in the retailers, we got to get the consumers to understand the value of organic biota and of sustainable farming and sustainable winemaking. That is what we need to communicate. How do we do it the best? And I think that is by having organizations like Allison, what, what you are doing with your group there is to put some framework together like you're doing to, you know, today we do it via Zoom and that's wonderful, but put events together, communicate as good as we possibly can, how important this is, how important it is that we take care of Mother Earth, that we do it by having great farming principles. We make great wines. We gotta communicate this as good as we can. I, I travel around, I get on my soapbox whenever I can. And I always talk about the number one thing is good conscious farming how important it is that people got to make sure whatever wine they put in their glass, that there's not a bunch of crappy chemicals that goes into that glass. That's going to give them a headache the next day. That is a good thing to drink good health, um, health um, uh, conscious green uh, wine. That is what we got to do. And we do it through these organizations. 
We do it by getting the media on board to go out, keep on telling the stories. If I could just jump in, one of the other things that, that I'm starting to see a little bit more of, and it, it seems to actually run consistent with all this encounter to what we used to see before is in um, packaging. Um, you know, I'm starting to see fewer heavy bottles uh, and all of the, the carbon stuff there. I'm, you know, you're seeing people doing more active things with kegs. You're seeing um, more alternative packaging going on out there. And I think that certainly contributes to part of reducing carbon footprints and all that. It'd be interesting um, to share with everybody. Are you guys doing, you know, what, what, if anything, are you doing with respect to your packaging um, to those elements of what you're doing in addition to in the vineyard to put out? Because um, I know one of the first things that a lot of my wine geeky friends say is when they pick up a bottle and the bottle is light, but it's a it's a good looking bottle and all that, they, they, they nod their head as, you know, that's one more element of um, sustainability that somebody is quote unquote getting. How does that touch your, your individual worlds? Oh, I'll just do a little quick one on it. First of all, all the glass we are making is made in California. We do not use Chinese or Mexican glass. We get glass from manufacturer that uses about 65% recycled glass material. Second is that foils, in my mind, is a waste of metal. It doesn't get recycled. We eliminate the foils. Our corks, we're using DM corks with the most efficient use of the cork material that comes out of Portugal. Our labels are printed on recycled paper and we use soy-based ink to print that. Wow. Other, other, other winemakers, uh, Holly, Melissa, Rich, what are you guys doing? Um, what are you intending to do if you're not doing it yet? Yeah, we, we ship wine up to um, Canada and they are requiring uh, lighter glass. So we are definitely um, incorporating lighter glass into our production. And then um, we also use twist off caps as well. So we'll, we'll have a mix of uh, corked wines and then twist off caps. And then uh, we also have um, a uh, wine in a bag. It's called Top Box, which has been really popular. Um, so we're trying to go to alternative uh, packaging as well in that sense. Melissa, anything to add there? Yeah, absolutely. We, similar comments, we've shifted our glass to lighter weight options across our SKUs and our largest blends uh, we have in a very economical glass, a lot light, lighter weight than when I first started working with the winery and the product and uh, we do an alternative uh, packaging as well we have a brand that we make called canned oregon so we're making uh, wines in cans so that's aluminum very lightweight recyclable and all that all that stuff so same thing we also use dm cork as for our cork and we were working with cork suppliers uh, several different ones for years and years and i'm really thrilled to be working with dm for quality and efficiency and all that and we also have uh, screw cap bottlings in one on our largest tier so all of those things are important to us for sustainability for sure and for cost savings and shipping and all all of the things okay. allison you have some more questions i was just going to add i think those things that were brought up are really now common trends, the lightweighting, alternative packaging. The other one I don't think anyone mentioned is wine kegs and restaurants, which as restaurants start to reopen, I think we'll see more and more because it is a way to make sure that every glass is fresh and great. Um, and then also obviously has a huge environmental impact. So that's mm -hmm. something that I think we'll see more of in the future. Let's see, so there were some questions about biodynamic and wanting Peter to talk a little bit about, hold on one second, chickens and mealybug control. <laughs> so Peter, maybe more general could be also what other animals are you using? I've heard some of you talk about owl boxes and I know some wineries are using falcons, but are you using animals in any other way in your vineyards? Yeah, I think the, the, the main principle here for us is that Mother Nature provides us with so many great tools, so many great ways of controlling some of the challenges, some of the pests that we have. And you know, the traditional way is you spray a bunch of pesticides, whether it's you know, insecticides or herbicides or fungicides. But there are often alternative ways to do it that involves insects, that involves animals, uh, like, like birds, we talked about that. And that is what we got to do is constantly look into are there more natural ways of fighting the challenges we have out there? 
instead of just grab a bunch of chemicals and put them out there. And uh, yes, I think it, it's something where, you know, I saw recently one of our neighbors, he brought in 150 sheep because he needed to cut his cover crop down. And right away, I'm like, I want to do that too, because yeah, it looks cool, but it makes so much sense is instead of sending a tractor out there that we've got to put diesel into to run that to cut the cover crop, then we send a bunch of sheep out there that will fertilize along the way. So we as, we as farmers got to constantly ask ourselves and share with each other and learn from each other, how can we do it? So it's still sustainable financially to do it. And, you know, Falcon is a great way to do it, but you, my understanding, you have to be of a certain size to make a sense out of it. But we got to, and again, that's where CSWA is great because, you know, what you put together with your people there, Alison, is just a, a bunch of real good practices that we share with each other and we will constantly, we constantly improve them Every year, I know you go through it and improve the guidelines, learn from what people are, best farmers are doing out there. And we can all learn from that and constantly get better. Anyone else want to comment on animals in the vineyard? Well, just I just wanted to comment on something Peter brought up because I think it's very important and that's that the sustainability initiatives in general have the ability to react and can change and can modify their practices in motion along the way. Uh, whereas some of the other eco uh, uh, certification programs do not. So that I think is, is really important, uh, allows us to share information, what's happening. Uh, we have vintages that are changing. We have um, different materials that are becoming more available. They may not be natural. They may be they may be synthetic, but they may be safer. And so, I think it's great to have that option, and to let science drive this a little bit more and allow us to make the best decisions going forward. Great, thanks. And Evan, I'll let you say any final comments you'd like to make, and then I can wrap it up from there. No, I, I think it's great. I, I want to um, first and foremost um, thank all of our winemakers um, for joining us today and adding so much value. Melissa, I'm going to take your egg analogy and use it for everything I do now. That was such a well and succinct uh, way of explaining things. Um, but I really, it, 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 it's, you know, you're all busy people. Take the time out of your schedules to, uh, to be with us today. It's great. And to supply the wines to be able to uh, illustrate uh, so much of that is, is important. Uh, Allison, I want to thank you and all of your team for everything that you do and for all of the other sister and brother organizations nationwide that are, that are jumping in that you uh, mentioned that many of our panelists have mentioned as well. And obviously, thanks to all of the people who have tuned in today um, to, uh, to hear from everybody. Uh, obviously, they care or they wouldn't be here. So uh, it's really a great opportunity, one that I feel very proud to uh, be, pay, play a small part in and um, thanks. Thanks so much, Evan. Um, and I'll just end by again, thanking our sponsors. Evan, thank you so much for moderating. We really appreciate it. All the vintners for sharing their stories and, and all their wines, which were delicious. It was really fun to try them. You got to visit four states in one single day without ever stepping foot on a plane, which was great. Um, and again, thanks to all of you for joining. We will be sharing links to the recordings and we'll respond to any unanswered questions. Um, Evan, there were a couple of wine related questions that I thought we could respond to after. Um, and finally, we hope you'll join us for the next two days. It's not too late to register. Um, there's a website, sustainablewinegrowing.us. Um, so that's a new website, new website that we just launched called United for a Sustainable Future. It's all about the U.S. sustainability commitment. And you'll find links to all of the U.S. programs that currently exist, as well as learn more about our industry's commitment and just about sustainable wine growing in general. So please check it out. And again, thanks so much and hope to see you all tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.